Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So welcome to the genomic session. I'm Bill Belosky from Microsoft Research. And um, I'm just going to talk for a minute. The format of this is that we have, we have four speakers, David Hausler, da David Patterson, David Heckerman, and George Varghese. And so there's the obvious lesson that to, to be respected in this field, you need to be named to David. Um, but other than that, I, one of the things that I've, that I've learned from thinking about science in general is that science follows tools, which is to say, because science is experimental, where you, where you find progress made is the places where you can explore new things. And so if you think about progress in physics, the really cool stuff in physics happened 100 years ago. Uh, and the reason for that is that the, the, while physics is intellectually complicated, it, the experiments that you need to do to understand relativity or to understand quantum mechanics are things that mostly you can do in a high school physics lab. They require decent clocks and a lot of brain power and a blackboard. When you think about biology, the amount of information in the sort of information theory sense in, in a biological system is tremendous. The human genome is, is three billion bases. The, the microbiome is 10 times bigger than that or, or more. And in order to be able to understand this, you need both instruments that can, can read the genome, and then you also need in, instruments that can process that amount of information, which is to say computers. So only, you know, the Human Genome Project finished 10 years ago. High volume sequencing has only been around for a couple of years. And, the, and honestly, the computational power to be able to handle data at that volume has only been around for, for a couple of years. And the consequence of that is that there's a lot of reason to believe that tremendous progress is going to be made over the next few decades in biology. And that in order to do it, it's going to need help from, from us, computer scientists. So um, this has caused me and a number of other people to start, start looking at problems in this area to see uh, what we can do to help. So I personally started, uh, started this after listening to a lecture a couple of years ago that was given by our first speaker, David Hausler. And he, he presented some, I'm not going to talk about what I'm doing, but he, he presented some problems and I thought, gee, I could probably do that better. And I was insanely naive, but it got me working in the field and, and I've been very happy about it. So the format that we're going to use here is we'll have our four talks and then uh, we'll have time for questions at the end. So if you think of questions for any of the speakers, you can just uh, do them at the end. And with that, I will introduce David Hausler, who is a professor at UC Santa Cruz and really the guy to talk to about uh, computational genomics and the, the CG Hub, the Cancer, Cancer Genome Hub. David. Thanks so much, Bill. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, let you know a little bit about what's happening in cancer genomics. First of all, genomes, the ability to sequence a whole human genome is, is poised to have a very profound effect on medicine. Nowhere more than in cancer, though, because cancer is a disease that's caused by individual mutations in the genome. Right now, our cancer therapies are one size fits all. For the most part, you get a chemotherapy drug that kills every dividing cell in your body. That's very indiscriminate approach. A targeted approach can give spectacular results, as you see here. So this patient with metastatic melanoma has a particular mutation. Each one of these lumps is a metastatic tumor, and they all were generated from an initial cell uh, that spread throughout the body, created tumors. And each one of those has a mutation, a, being, a gene called BRAF, uh, where uh, it's a particular change, amino acid change, that occurs at position 600 in the protein. There's a drug that was made uh, by Roche uh, that specifically kills every cell that is exhibiting that mutant form of BRAF. Patient takes that drug, vermorafenib. Fifteen weeks later, that's what he looks like. Working out at the gym, swimming in the pool, unprecedented in this type of metastatic melanoma. So this shows you that there is incredible potential with precision medicine's approach to cancer, 
rather than the one size fits all. If we understand the molecular cause of the disease, what mutations are precisely driving each tumor, then we can come up with a single drug or perhaps a cocktail that addresses this. Why you might need a cocktail is illustrated by looking at the patient 23 weeks later. And if you actually look at these tumors, that map is reproduced a few weeks later. By and large, not all of them, but by and large, there was at least one cell that either was inherently resistant or became resistant to this one blocking drug. Very reminiscent of HIV AIDS. Each one of these tumors has billions of cells and it only takes one to evade it and regrow the tumor. So you wanna hit it with a cocktail or with an adaptive therapy where the patient's own immune system is adaptively changing to the cancer's every move. These are the exciting new frontiers that we have in cancer and we'll get to them through cancer genomics which is the subject of today's talk. So motivation, Obviously, saving lives is the number one motivation. Cancer is in a, a very pervasive disease. Um, it is, is so pervasive that I'm sure everybody has been touched with it somewhere in their family or close friends. If we can gather together information about the molecular nature of cancer by sequencing cancer genomes, then we can start to understand what are the basic insights into how we can precision, treat with precision every one of the different kinds of mutations that drive cancer. We have to link these mutations to the clinical outcomes, both in response to uh, frontline normal uh, standard of care and in response to these new targeted therapies. We have to create an infrastructure that will allow us to collect data on specific subpopulations that we, so we can get them into clinical trials and carefully test. But what we really need is more than traditional clinical trials is a rapid learning cycle that's global essentially. So that every cancer's course is recorded and those case histories are shared electronically and become part of the great, greater knowledge of cancer. And finally, um, with all of this molecular understanding, we will gain a mechanistic understanding of cancer at the molecular level. Every one of these things requires statistical power, and that will be the main theme of this. We are not in a position to share large numbers of cancer data today, but we must get there. So we must get to a point where a patient has molecular information assayed for their tumor, and soon that will be whole genome sequencing. And it, in, in, in cancer, in our research today, you sequence the normal tissue of the cancer, maybe of the patient, no, maybe from a bloodline or other blood sample or other tissue sample, but you also sequence the tumor and you look for those changes that are mutations that are specific to the tumor in that person and not in the rest of the cells, the normal cells in that person's body. And if you had a database of millions of other cancer genomes and you could find patterns in similar cases, you would be in a better position to treat that patient with precision to the actual molecular categories that his mutations or her mutations fall into. In order to take a survey of the cancer genome, the different types of genomes, the National Center for Cancer, uh, the National Cancer Institute instigated a cancer genome atlas program a few years ago with the target of 10,000 tumors, 500 tumors from each of 20 adult cancers. There's a parallel program on childhood cancers called Target. These are the institutes that are involved in that in terms of generating the data, and these are the institutes that are involved in analyzing the data. And all of those data come to a repository that we built uh, called the Cancer Genomics Hub. We also were successful and we hold the Childhood Cancer Project. In fact, CG Hub holds all of the large-scale cancer genomics information created by the National Cancer Institute at this point. These data are used 
not only by the researchers that you see in this network, but we have hundreds of other users who have applied to get access to these data. They're sensitive personal genome information, so we don't post them on the internet freely, but you can apply and uh, state your research goals and your credentials and then gain access to these data. The total cost of this repository for all of the current NCI's programs, when they get to about 50,000 genomes, which we assume now after these this uh, 20,000 genomes from, uh, from, tar uh, from the Cancer Genome Atlas and more from subsequent programs, soon there will be at uh, something like 50,000 genomes, would be about $100 per genome per year. Uh, and this is costs uh, that we, these are real numbers because we operate the thing. So that's, that's how much it costs to pay the personnel. And I must say, a lot of that is compliance and paperwork and, you know, uh, other things that aren't directly related. Uh, to the actual storage infrastructure. But um, that gives you a data point uh, of how much it costs to house already 50,000 genomes. That will take about five petabytes. We're, we're planning to grow. Uh, we're about one petabyte now and planning to grow uh, up to five at some point. At this point, we've transferred about six terabytes of information to researchers around the world. Uh, and this happened essentially in the last six months. We, people are downloading at about three gigabits per second. But if you look to the future, the need here is international. And so we are now working on thinking about how we would set up a global network of hubs and move this into an environment where we're not just storing the data, but we're actually bringing compute to the data as in a cloud type system. And Dave Patterson and I have been involved extensively in this and Dave is gonna tell you all about the details so I'm not gonna go into the design, uh, but uh, we put out a white paper uh, recently, last summer, uh, and described how we would do a million cancer genomes. That was part of the inspiration uh, for the formation of a new global alliance that has now formed. It was announced in June. Uh, I'm on the organizing committee for this, and we now have over 90 different institutions worldwide that have signed on. We're modeling ourselves after the World Wide Web Consortium as, an, uh, as a way that people can come together over standards and uh, a neutral uh, area that, that allows party, parties to innovate and share in, a, in, in, an, in an era of open, open and level playing field platforms. And we're really hoping to work with you and others to develop some of these first prototypical platforms and set the standards. We believe strongly in developing platforms at the same time you are developing standards. So what does it look like to look at cancer data? I'm gonna now, for the next several slides, kind of dive in and give you a feel for these data. So the data come from raw reads, and raw reads are a few hundred bases of DNA uh, that are extracted from one of these high throughput sequencing machines. Each of those reads is mapped to a location in the reference human genome. We're all 99.9% .9 identical, and so it's relatively easy to map most of these reads to a unique portion of the genome and that where they'll only differ in a few bases. Uh, but there are highly repetitive parts of the genome where it's very confusing uh, and difficult to map these reads. Each of these is one of those reads that you see. Uh, so this is a read of DNA, and this is a location in the reference genome here on chromosome two at a certain position. So it turns out um, that this is a case in which we have uh, an unusual mapping. If this is the chromosome two coordinate system for the standard genome, and these are reads, this gray represents a bunch of reads that are piled up like you see here, a pile up. You see that the reads map normally, but then there's a segment where you're getting extra reads. And more importantly, there's a segment where part of the read matches here and the rest of the read matches back here. So it's as if the genome looped back and redid this portion. And in fact, that's exactly what happens in the genome. A big hunk of DNA, about 500,000 bases, is simply repeated in tandem in this cancer genome abnormally. 
Whereas the normal genome would only have one copy, you have two copies in a row. So we can deduce that by a combination of looking at the extra reads that map to that region as if we were somehow getting too many reads from that and these funny loopbacks that go back and take a second shot at that region. This is the art, actually, unfortunately not completely a science, but an art of interpreting these data. We are doing lots of comparisons for the best groups that are available right now, that are working right now on the Cancer Genome Atlas and the International Cancer Genome Consortium data. And when we look to see how we can interpret those cancer genomes, even if we look at single base changes, is an A changed to a T at this position? Well, there's a lot of agreement. There are actually a lot of cases where we disagree about that. So it's not easy to read these genomes with 100% accuracy, and that comes from the fact that we have noisy, short, small reads. If you look about these structural changes, these are structural changes where one part of the genome is connected to another part of the reference genome by a read, then uh, there's a little bit less agreement, something like 70 to 80 percent agreement between two of the top programs, our program at Santa Cruz and another program at the Broad Institute. So we got a ways to go to really, really understand how we can interpret the data that's coming off the sequencing machine. We get better if we go deeper, uh, read the genome instead of an average of 30 times, an average of 60 or 100 times, but that's very expensive. So there's a trade-off between cost and accuracy of interpretation of these data. We study cancers that are related to each other, and one of the specialties at Santa Cruz is uh, brain cancer. I actually have a wet lab as well as a dry lab, and so we do uh, studies of developing brain cancer in our lab and other aspects of the developing neocortex. And here we see uh, one of the deadliest brain cancers, glioblastoma, analyzed uh, from the point of large-scale events, which have actually knocked out large parts of the chromosome. And what we see is repeatedly in, in, in these uh, GBMs, and in, in particular 11 out of 16 of the cases of glioblastoma, we see two separate events that knocked out both copies of this gene, CDKN2AB. This is what's called a tumor suppressor gene. You have to have this gene in order to be resistant to the cancer. Once you lose it, then the, can then the cells can grow in an uncontrolled fashion. And in order for that to happen, you actually have to lose both copies of the gene, the one you got from mom and the one you got from dad. Those typically happen in two separate events, and, and we can see that the prevalence is enormously high. In these other GBMs, those genes are probably inactivated by other mechanisms, and we're looking at other ways in which small mutations or something like this might have inactivated them. In one of these cases, the way this gene was inactivated was rather spectacular. It was with an event called chromothripsis. In this case, the net effect is that the chromosomes are actually broken up into hundreds of pieces in certain areas. Usually it's one area of one chromosome or an area of one or two chromosomes that's essentially shattered, and those pieces are put together, again, in some random form to repair. When you glue the ends of pieces together randomly, you often get these circular pieces, which are called double minute chromosomes, and had been observed under the microscope for decades, actually, in cancers. This is the first time where we can take one of those circular pieces of DNA and actually deduce its structure completely from genome sequencing. And what we did was, essentially trace the patterns of reads, and we see that this part of the read connects to this place, this place connects to this place, and so forth. Um, and if you trace these paths of connection, you eventually get back to where you started from, and you realize in this case there are two small circular pieces of DNA in this person's brain tumor. Not only are there circular, abnormal circular pieces of DNA, but they contain very important genes. The, they're highly amplified, so we have almost 80 copies of this one and 40 copies of this in each cell. And on those are the opposite side, opposite kind of tumor, if tumor suppressor genes, like I was talking to you about before, are the breaks that you lose. Then these are the accelerator pedals of cancer. EGFR and MDM2 are genes that, when they're overactive, drive the cells to uh, evade 
uh, program cell death and, and propagate in an uncontrolled way. Here's a second one, uh, GBM, that also has uh, one of these uh, small double minute circular chromosomes and it also has MDM2 in it as a driving force. And this is uh, laboratory work showing the, the, this, this pink background shows the enormous numbers of copies of this spread throughout the cell. So it's li we lit it up in pink and these are control, the greens are control uh, things that you see only have a few copies. So this pink bad circular piece of DNA is pervasive in these cancer cells according to our wet lab validations. I'm not going to summarize but in fact, looking at all of these data now, not just about these genes like CDKN2A you hear and EGFR mutations. So if you actually look at the mutations in all of these genes, different types of mutations that are happening, then you see that GBMs actually fall into a discrete set of classes that have different characteristics and should be de treated differently. So when you have a molecular understanding, you realize that any cancer you looked at clinically or through the microscope is actually not just one cancer. It's not 10 cancers often. It may be hundreds of different sub-subtypes of cancer based on the actual molecular pathways that are being disrupted within there. And when you know that, you know to treat them individually. Now, for you, you are all computer scientists. One of the real challenges here is that we think about this simplistically. We think about Every cell in your body has your regular genome that you inherited from mom and dad. It just gets replicated. And then these cancer cells have one abnormal genome. Well, it turns out that cancer cells keep mutating. And so a tumor actually can have cells with different genomes in it. These are called clones. And essentially, what happens in a tumor is like a little bit of Darwinian selection all by itself. The, 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 but to the cells with the nastiest combination of mutations that cause them to grow fastest tend to take over the tumor and shove the other cells out. And this is happening throughout the time course of the evolution of a tumor. So at any time, now you look at it, you see these dark gray, dark uh, orange to light orange and so forth. You see different clonal expansions. So there's actually usually not just one, but maybe two, three, or four different genomes within the cells of a tumor. And we need to separate those out when we're looking at all these data. So it's, it's hard. So a cancer is a metagenome. People who are looking at bacterial samples are used to this, right? They dig up the dirt or, or uh, some body cavity and you find all different types of genomes from bacteria mixed together. Now, cancer is like that too sometimes. There's a framework which I won't have time to go into that we've developed which not only deals with the fact that you loop back and repeat things and you rearrange things, but the fact that you mix together different versions of that whole rearrangement pattern into one genome. It's a flow-based theory. We're very excited about it, and we'll, we'll have a paper on that shortly. Um, we apply that from an algebraic uh, computational point of view, the little linear programming, uh, to analyze these data and in simple cases, it gives you what you expect. So this is the case that we, this is another case like the one we looked at before. These are the reads. There's extra reads in here. And there's some reads that loop back. And so what we'd like to do is go from this noisy data to uh, integral data. It's essentially saying, well, if this is happening in 67% of the cells, then we'll break it out and we'll assume that every one of the, we'll, we'll say that every one of those cells is digitally duplicated from copy one to copy two at exactly this point and connected in exactly this way. So we go from noisy, uh, nasty analog data essentially to precise digital genetic interpretations of the multiple genomes that exist in the cancer sample. And this is quite challenging. I don't claim that we've completely solved the problem, uh, but, but that's the essence. Here's a case of a deletion. And finally, last uh, content slide here. After you have actually determined what clones are in the cancer and what actual genetic mutations are in those clones and how those might be driving the cancer, you have to think in terms of the biology of cancer and the pathways. For example, CDKN2A and B act in concert with other genes they repress these genes, which repress RB, which represses the progression of cells. 
cell cycle. And, and if you see uh, the same similar thing happens over here where it's involved in our friend MDM2 that you saw. Um, so when we amplify MDM2, it has a similar effect to losing CDKN2A, which are the two things that we saw because they, CDKN2A inhibits MDM2. And M amplifying MDM2 screws you up because it's supposed to be inhibiting, uh, it's, it inhibits P53, and you don't want to inhibit P53. That is your protection against cancer. So the logic of these pathways of interaction are fundamental to deciding how you would treat a patient with a certain set of molecular lesions. So the logic of going from what you read in the genome accurately to an accurate uh, understanding of what's actually going on in the genome, and then finally to an accurate understanding of how the pathways are perturbed, and then finally to a combination of drugs you want to prescribe, are all very complicated decision procedures that must be automated, as we were hearing in the previous session. It's beyond human capacity to do this for the doc to just, the kindly old doc, to actually do this stuff in his or her head. So, it's a big deal that we're collecting all of this information at all of these different levels, and I think this is really the age of opportunity for cancer research and for other types of medical research based on genomic information. But the number one infrastructure issue is we will not be able to achieve the statistical power we need to decompose these pathways and understand all of these genotype-phenotype relationships unless we get into the millions. And we're looking at information silos where every hospital is keeping their own data secretly away, and that's what the alliance is trying to break. We want to get people to share so that scientists can aggregate data and understand it together. Even with a million genomes, though, that interpretive challenge will be immense. We need to understand these pathways and how they work, and we need to be able to read our molecular data better. This is the key, and uh, I thank you for uh, listening. This is uh, uh, the work with many other people. Um, Dave will get set up. Dave's one of my closest collaborators. Um, we have uh, a number of collaborators at other institutions, and um, there's a great group at Santa Cruz. Thank you. Just go to the next slide. Any questions? We need your mic. We're, we'll do questions at the end. Okay. Is that me? Okay, you look at the slides at the end. Okay. Well, you do that, and I'll introduce you. Okay. Okay, so now I have the great pleasure to introduce Dave Patterson, who almost needs no introduction, but I will anyway. He's a professor at EECS in Berkeley. He, um... Hey, Dave. David. Yeah. <laughs> My slides are here somewhere? They should be there somewhere. Uh, can somebody help them? They're, uh... Yep, yeah, okay. Oh, see, um, go down and select the PowerPoint down here. You might have oh, another one open. Uh, this one? Yeah. Hassler, no, those aren't. There we go. There you go. There you go. Yep. Um, <laughs> we didn't open it. Oh, that looks like it opened it. Okay. Yes, how many distinguished computer scientists does it take to open a PowerPoint deck? Um, <laughs> Anyway, um, Dave has done a number of things that have changed the world already. He, he ran the RAID project, he, he did RISC, he did the Network of Workstations project that um, the ideas of which are basically all of uh, data center cluster computing now. Um, and he said something, and I've been going to his retreats for, for 20 years now, um, and he said something uh, when we were starting this that, that really rung true with me, which is that it's not the number of projects you start that matter, it's the number that, that you finish. And so you should do a, a small number of things, do them well, and make them be something that matters. And so um, when the idea that, that you could take computer science techniques and apply it to cancer occurred to him, it, it motivated me to, to work on this. And, and I think he's really right. If, um, if it's the case that we as computer scientists can actually help with curing what's soon to be the number one cause of death in the United States. Don't we have to try? Yeah. I hope I haven't stolen your thunder. <laughs> yep, he stole my thunder. Uh, I think what, I'll, I'll do a couple of slides to set up, but then I think I'll wax philosophic here. Uh, 
Uh, David Hausler is, we should have just given the whole session to him. He does about as much work as at least five to ten faculty. He's got 75 people working for him. He even does, uh, he even does wet lab work. You don't have to do that to work in this field, so I think we'll talk about that. I'll tell you a little bit about the AMP Lab. Opportunities for computer science were all wax philosophic. The AMP Lab is a big data lab. Uh, it, it has serious machine learning people, uh, as well as databases, system networking. Our goal is to re uh, release a, a new software stack, the next Berkeley Unix or the next Ingress or Postgres, we hope. Uh, uh, we got funded by the NSF and by DARPA and lots of companies, including uh, Microsoft, and we got mentioned by the president when the government got, when government got interested in big data. So building on top of the Hadoop file system, we have a cluster operating system resource manager, an idea of keeping things in memory yet being reliable, Spark, which is a a uh, cluster programming framework, an alternative to Hadoop or MapReduce. Uh, we have a streaming version of that. Well, we can put a SQL interface on top of it. Uh, we are going to do an approximate uh, as part of a big data project. A, a, rather than a database giving the exact answer, it would give an approximate answer much more quickly. And then, you know, the big excitement in machine learning and big data is how are we going to teach millions of people. Not everybody can work for Michael Jordan as a as a graduate student, so how are we going to teach people to do that? So we're trying to do a declarative mach machine learning thing that anybody can use the right machine learning algorithm. David's, let me do this quickly, it's, you know, it, this, this disease grabs us because it's so pervasive, a third of all men, half of, a third of all women, half of all men will face it. It's, we now know, surprisingly recently, it's a genetic disease. The sequencing price is falling, this is required to Every talk has to have this slide. It's approaching $1,000. And what are the bad news? Well, the people building this software aren't trained in, in how to build software. Uh, the pro and so the processing costs are going to be bigger than the wet lab costs, and there's no place to store this stuff. So where can we help? And I say there's three things. Build uh, stuff that works and is reliable uh, for these software pipelines to do the analysis like David was talking about. Put this all together and make it uh, easy to use, uh, dependable, and privacy pres preserving of this million genomes that David says the minimum we need to get, and bring our benchmarking culture to this field. Now, I think I wanted to wax philosophic so I don't forget about this. Uh, you know, my story of getting involved was that uh, I had to give a talk at Santa Barbara about the AMP Lab, and we really didn't have any data that was big. We had a big data lab with no data. <laughs> so I found a person visiting us and, and he convinced me that genomics was a, cancer genomics was a good opportunity and so we invited David to our first retreat and he said he gave an inspiring talk and convinced us to do it. That's where Bill got uh, hooked, hooked into this. So we were two-ish year, the retreat was two years ago, so I'm two years into this. My last biology course was in ninth grade, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't have any expertise, just faith that this is a good thing to do. Uh, so, I, I, you know, kind of the hypothesis is that those of us who know how to use keyboards can make as significant a contribution as the people who know what to do with test tubes. Uh, so that's a pretty, you know, arrogant uh, statement to make, but I'd say two years into this, I believe it, you know, I asked David that question two years ago and he said, sure, but he says sure to everybody. He's a really nice guy and he does it. Uh, but I think it's true. I think, it, I think we're going to be, we have the opportunity to make as big a contribution. What I've learned so far is biology is a very different culture than computer science. We're the uh, hippie, friendly, let's get along, let's share our data, we'll even show you the code before we finished it. Yeah, biology is not that way. Uh, so uh, there's a culture clash there. They're not welcoming us with open arms. They, oh boy, please publish in our journals. No, that's not the way they react. <laughs> they, they, uh, and uh, they're pretty nasty in their comments. They don't, they, 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 they aren't willing simply to reject a paper with a nice try. They go, they'll go after your scientific integrity as part of a, a review. Uh, it, so I'm, as a kind of a senior person, I think there's this great opportunity. It's a little unclear to me how publishing is gonna work in this, right? There's a danger in forming new conferences or new journals, you know, uh, but there's also a danger in, in the biologists uh, locking it us out. Uh, I, what I've been interested in, and of course funding is always a challenge for, for everybody, I think what's been really interesting to me is I find uh, my soulmates in the clinicians. The people who have patients that they're trying to cure are kind of like 
you know, having impact, technology transfer. We want to build things, lots of people use them. They, they have problems they want to solve and patients want to use them, and they want our help. They, they have all this data, there's, is the, there's talk before lunch, there's going more data than any human being can know what to do with, they would love our help, right? So these people like us, they think we have value. It's not clear about the biologists, but the biologists control kind of the academic journals, so I don't know the, the uh, solution to that. So, it's, so I'm enthusiastic, I'm, I'm leaping forward, I'm going to spend the next five years of my life uh, working on this thing because it's so compelling, but there's a bunch of kind of sociological issues we got to fix here. Um, so, uh, stepping off my, so stepping back from the sermon here, from my, uh, so this is the, the group that we, I've somehow sucked into this, like Tom Sawyer uh, <laughs> painting, painting the fence. Got people from all over working with this, a bunch of great students and postdocs at Berkeley in both machine learning computational biology system, and then external collaborators, including Bill right here and uh, David Hausler, as well as some people at a place that's called the Broad, which was the leading, uh, e maybe the leading East Coast place in this area. So lack of software engineering by scientists, another arrogant thing to say. Well, this one's documented. Uh, <laughs> this was an article in Nature a few years ago. They surveyed them, uh, the scientists, and most of them have taught themselves programming. They only think formal training, only a third of them think the formal training is worth anything, and clearly less than half of them know what testing is. So what's the consequences of that? Uh, so at one of my colleagues at UC San Diego in the Scripps Institute, he had to re retract five papers, including a paper from science, which is the thing that gets these guys all excited. It's like a, a mini Nobel Prize if you get a, on the cover of Science Magazine. He had to withdraw five papers because his result was just a bug in software from another lab. So five papers, including very prestigious ones. So I never want to withdraw, have to withdraw papers in my career, and I never want to be the guy that they blame for doing that. Uh, so, so there's an opportunity, for, you know, just building what they're already building, but building it well. And plus, we know algorithms, right, and data structures. Here. I'll, I'll give you some examples about that. So there, there's a huge opportunity there. So our first result is SNAP that got inspired by Hausler's talk that Bolesky said we should be able to do it faster than that, and that's led to a collaboration between uh, Microsoft, a very close collaboration between Microsoft and, uh, and Berkeley. Uh, the traditional approaches had used the Burroughs Wheeler algorithm from, you know, that's the Burroughs and Wheeler from the guys from good old Dex Circ. Uh, instead, uh, Bill's idea was to use long hash tables. We have bigger memories now. We can use bigger hash tables. We'll do overlapping seeds rather than error dependent ones. The hash table's a little bigger, but so what? And one of the Berkeley students came up with a better string matching algorithm than is typically used. Uh, and this thing happens to get better as the read lengths get bigger. The read lengths are the number of base pairs there that these high throughput sequencing machines, they're high throughput because they take, break up the, the, the re recordings of DMA in these little tiny pieces, so you can do a lot of them in parallel, but over time there's a Moore's law for this base pair thing, and it's increasing rapidly over time. An algorithm works even better than the competitors as the, as the read lengths get longer, and which is happening quickly. This is an old uh, version of a slide. This is the standard way you're supposed to do it. Uh, the x-axis is the error rate, so this is a very, very high error rate, and this is you know, an error rate of one in a million or one in 10 million. Snap is the one, R's right there. Uh, and uh, you can see uh, this, is, and BWA is the standard that uh, by far most people use. Uh, but we were excited about the speed of it, and I, I don't know where we are, Bill. Is that two, three? Uh, th anyways, every time Bill sees his slides, he tries to get, make Snap do a little better. And so <laughs> this, is a, this is a couple weeks, this is a, a month old, so I think it's probably even higher now. But it's, uh, it's about that fast. So it's much faster because we believe that curve about all of the, uh, the, the sequencing that's coming because of the dropping cars. We put it out as open source before it was even done, and a person picked it up and added an RNA, an RNA aligner. We're a DNA aligner, and, and he did it all by himself, and, he, and he, so that was a success of open source and being hippie, sherry kind of people. And then they wanted the output in the standard format uh, to be sorted. So uh, Ravi, who is here, and Bill, or I can't remember which one did it, so the, 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 the standard pipeline is called GATK from the Broad, and just the pieces that we did went from about 100 hours. Yeah, so these aren't, uh, when you see times like this, I'm used to thinking, you know, seconds, you know, 
or minutes maybe. I thought maybe it was minutes. These are hours, right? This is, this is 100 hours. When was the last time you saw something that lasted 100 hours? There's a 24-hour there's a sort. You know, what, what are they doing? You know? <laughs> so so uh, Bill and Ravi uh, put this together, and just that piece is a factor of 10 faster uh, for what's being done. So I think there's a real opportunity uh, to build these pipelines. The, uh, David alluded to, what are we going to do with all this data that we get back? We have to store it. We can't throw it away. And part of what he uh, convinced us to do was to, uh, to make a right paper to talk about it. I really was influenced in getting into this by this book, uh, Emperor of All Maladies. If you're interested, I'd encourage you to read the book. It's a history of cancer by a really great writer who's also a medical researcher. It won the Pulitzer Prize. And he said, uh, you know, towards the end of the book, because it was very depressing, about the way it could be in the future is a woman shows up with breast cancer, goes to the oncologist. Uh, her DNA is already sequenced. She kind of brings there with the equivalent of a USB key. The software identifies the pathways associated with those variations in the genome. They target the therapies, those the pathways after the tumor is removed. And then over time, like David suggested, there'd be these HIV-like drug cocktail, and as cancer transforms itself, which it does nastily over time, we'd change the cocktail and maybe take medicine the rest of the life like HIV, but it'd be controlled uh, much like other diseases are today. The bad news in this book is he said 2050. So I was, I was with him right up to 2050. 2050 is a tad late for me. <laughs> uh, and so I'm, I'm, I believed him when, that, that this is something that's going to affect all of us. So, okay, if not me, what about my kids? I, don't wanna, I, I want us to make progress so it's not just our grandchildren who can uh, be cured from cancer, but those more closely. In last November, we, f we worked on this thing for six months, uh, a, a collaboration between uh, UC Santa Cruz and UC Berkeley. Uh, to try and say, hey, we could do this. And the main point was to say it's not that expensive. We could save all the data and put the clinical information together so we could do the correlations and make progress on this terrible disease. That led to the, well, I don't know if that led. We got invited to, we got invited, or David got invited, and I, I, I'm his, I tag along to this uh, meeting so that created this global alliance, which is an attempt to break down all these silos, which is very, uh, unlike the culture of, of biology, the clinical data, that countries around the world would pledge that we're going to figure out a way to work together to share this data, including the information. Uh, so, you know, we've made, we got as far as announcing it, so we'll see what happens, but this could be a big deal. Uh, what would be in there? The very basic reads that come out of the sequencing machines, we can't throw that away because later on we'll, we may find, like David was saying about the hundreds or thousands of different types of cancers in a tumor, we may not, our, our equipment may be too primitive, our algorithms are too primitive to see what's going on, so we want to save it. The variations or the differences between, our, uh, between us and our, in our genomes, that's what's called the variation database, and then putting in the patient data, which isn't all that much. Uh, we said, David's experience, that cost him $100 a year at the million genome scale, we said conservatively, you know, $50 a year or $25 a year, just really to say if it's a thousand dollars sequence the genome, it costs almost nothing relatively to keep it, uh, keep it around. And cancer is kind of the poster child for all kinds of other genetic diseases. Uh, a big obstacles aren't technical in our view. With cloud computing, there's lots of things that are sensitive and much bigger than the, the genome data that's out there. We know how to build this stuff, but we have to agree as a society uh, how to have what's called a portable consent that a patient will come in and say, yes, that's fine, you can use it for medical research, and we don't have to have every hospital has their own consent form, which is today's case. Um, and we need to standardize not on file formats, which is the field tends to use, but more on APIs like we're used to so we can allow innovation to, hap to happen underneath it. Uh, you know, our field's been transformed by benchmarking. I'm in computer architecture. There was a time when we didn't know how to, we, we made, everybody built a computer and ran their own program and said, mine is better than yours, and you didn't run the same program. Well, we, you know, kind of 30 years ago, computer architecture figured out that's a bad idea. We standardized benchmarks. Up and to the right, computers, you know, what people think of as Moore's Law was really just transistors, and architects turned that into performance. Same thing happened in computer vision about 10 years ago. No benchmarks. Everybody had their own, own uh, new algorithm. They ran their own image, and they said there's better than yours, but without running it on the same data. Uh, people at Berkeley realized you need to have benchmarks to compare things. For the last decade, 
uh, they have all agreed on these standard benchmarks and huge progress in uh, computer vision. We need to bring that culture uh, to genomics. So uh, uh, why is it harder? There, you, we don't know, only God knows what's, what's the actual 3.2 billion base pairs. Uh, so uh, we don't know what the ground truth is, which is one reason it's there. We don't, but we don't even agree on what the right metrics are. Uh, we don't do sh common data sets. Uh, people, if you use simulations, they simulate their own data. And they say, well, this must be right because we got the same answer as these other guys. Quoting uh, Lord Byron, uh, he's, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. And that's kind of, I think that's one of my life's uh, lessons here. So we got to figure out what to do. So what we really like to have for this, uh, for the variant calling is these three pieces, what's called the reference. And I think if we're assembling a jigsaw puzzle, the reference is kind of the cover of the box. The short reads themselves from these high throughput sequencing machines, the millions of those things, or billions of those things, and s how to validate it. Since only God knows what's there, we need to have error bars on this. You know, there's no r exact right answer. We have to say, uh, we think this is uh, uh, within, this is how well we know the data. So what we, this benchmark proposal that we have has three pieces, R, C, and H, that is real, not synthetic, comprehensive, it's the whole genome, not just samples, and human, that's what we care about, people. Nothing has all of that, so what I'm gonna try and do is, we're gonna try and approximate that with two of the three pieces. This is complete, human, and real. So uh, this one is human and, uh, and, and complete, but it's synthetic. This one is complete and real, but it's, it's not human. And this one is real and human, but it's only a sample, not the whole thing. And so uh, what, that's where our name comes from. This is synthetic and the mouse and the pieces of the human. That, so our acronym is SMASH, synthetic mouse and sampled human. Uh, how should we do benchmarking today? We want to, uh, here's the error bars we were talking about in terms of accuracy. And here's two popular uh, SNP variant callers from two of the leading organizations. And we thought the right way to do this is take advantage of cloud computing. And we happened to pick Amazon, but we could pick anybody and include both the cost and the hours to be able to do that. So you'd see the GATK from the Broad is much more accurate, but much slower and, uh, and therefore more expensive. And for some of these cases, the M pileup was virtually as fast. So depending on what you're trying to do, it would do that. So let me uh, wrap up here. It's, uh, you know, the excitement is about the dropping costs of genetic sequencing, hopefully to get to the mythical $1,000 genome pretty soon. Cancer is this terrible disease that affects, uh, affects all of us. And I really believe there's this chance for us to be able to help fight cancer, which is, I never thought that. I never thought at any time I'd be able to do that. Philosophically, too, Bill made another interesting observation at that retreat is that, you know, for the first 50 years of computer science, we didn't have to ask other people what was wrong with computers, right? <laughs> they crashed, software didn't work, hardware was expensive. We, we had plenty of stuff to work on. But now 50 years into this or so, maybe we need to be inspired by other problems. And, I, and obviously, you know, helping people with cancer is a very inspiring problem. So building better software pipelines with new algorithms, saving the data away and uh, bringing benchmarking so we can really accelerate this progress so we don't have to wait till, you know, so that we could, it's not, you know, our grandchildren are a benefit, but it's our children or us who benefit. And then stealing my punchline, uh, you know, after I gave that talk uh, at Santa Barbara, I said, talk went well. And then I woke up the next morning and said, oh my God, I believe what I said, <laughs> we could really help. So if there's a chance we can help, aren't we as, you know, moral people, aren't we, don't we have to try? All right, thank you very much. Okay, I think if I do this. Look at that, okay. <laughs> the only working mic, so. All right. Okay, thank you, and sorry about the punchline. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> steal mine. Um, I, I promise not to steal yours. <laughs> um, <laughs> So next up, we have David Heckerman, who runs the eScience group in Microsoft Research from Los Angeles, although his people are scattered all over the place. Um, and he, he actually designs algorithms to look at the output of some of the stuff that you've heard about, that you heard about from uh, Dave Patterson. Um, and Thank you very much, Bill. It's a pleasure to be here at the David session. Uh, George and Bill, if you change your name, we can make it five for five. 
All right. <laughs> uh, so this is a very boring title. So what, what I'm really going to talk about today is, uh, let me get this clip done. My sh** in the wrong parody here. How's that? Uh, what I'm really going to talk about is making something that was essentially impossible from a computational standpoint, it's now possible. And it's in the area of uh, personalized medicine, otherwise known as precision me medicine, which is what we've been talking about today. Uh, by the way, this work is um, uh, in joint uh, collaboration with, and Backspace does not work. Uh, there we go. Yeah, uh, with Christoph, Jennifer, Bob, Carl, and Hoi Fung, all in the eScience group. Um, our group it basically takes ma machine learning and applies it to um, uh, uh, important uh, so uh, soci society challenges. Um, we uh, l basically engage with scientists. We listen to them, find out what tools they don't have and tools they really need, and then try to uh, create those tools for them. I'm not going to talk. Uh, these are some of the projects we're, do going, uh, we're doing today. Uh, uh, I'm not going to talk about uh, 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 two or three of them. Uh, we're working in HIV vaccine design, also uh, vaccine design for common cold and hepatitis C. We're working to sequence sugarcane, which is a very important biofuel. But today I want to talk about uh, human genomics, obviously, and personalized medicine. So this is the uh, slide that Dave showed. I think all uh, genomicists have this slide, and it should basically just be a screensaver for the, uh, right. the <laughs> session, and then we can uh, dispense with it. Obviously, there's a genomics and revolution that's being driven by the rapid, rapid decrease in cost of sequencing. Not only is the cost coming down rapidly, but the time it takes to sequence the genome is, is uh, dropping rapidly. Um, and uh, it's just creating a massive uh, influx of data and interesting problems. So again, I want to talk about personalized medicine or precision medicine. You've already heard uh, the, a, an example of that in cancer, but you can also uh, use genetic markers to uh, diagnose a disease, to infer the propensity that you're going to get a disease, not just cancer, predict a favorable reaction to a drug, predict a non-favorable reaction to a drug, and so forth. And one of the main components of personalized medicine, or a key component of personalized medicine, is what's known as genome-wide association studies, which we all call GWAS. Uh, and this is what, what you do is you uh, take the genome and measure. You can, you can do whole genome sequencing now or exome sequencing. But uh, what has been done traditionally up, up through now in the last uh, half a decade or so is to just measure uh, areas uh, in, the, in the genome that vary a lot from one person to another. These are typically, uh, these single variations are referred to as single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs. So most of your DNA is the same. These are, a di this is DNA of different people. Every once in a while you have a variation. And now what you can do, if you're interested in what variations are associated with disease, you take a bunch of people that have the disease, you take a bunch of people who don't have the disease, you measure these SNPs, and then you look for differences. Uh, and this has been very successful. Uh, you can barely see the chromosomes here. These bars, these gray bars, are, are, are your chromosomes, and each colored dot here represents some successful GWAS where they found some interesting correlation between uh, some SNP or set of SNPs and some trait of interest. So uh, with GWAS, uh, there's, there's some tricky things that go on. Um, uh, most of genomics is not like Mendel's peas. It's not one variant determines whether the flower is pink or white. Uh, for most traits of interest, certainly for common diseases, it's, it's much more holographic. The signal, the, the genomic markers that influence uh, the trait are spread out across the entire genome, and they're very weak, and they all uh, integrate together in subtle ways to produce uh, the trait of interest. Uh, and so to pick up these signals, uh, you need lots of data. Uh, David Hausler mentioned this already. And this is, um, this is certainly happening. For example, uh, Decode, 23andMe, Kaiser, these groups have already collected um, these GWAS data sets for uh, over 100,000 people each. Uh, and when you have these, these large data sets, you inevitably get yourself into tr trouble speaking statistically. You get what we call false positives. Namely, you have a situation where you think there's an association. It really looks like there's an association between the SNP and the trait. And it turns out 
It's not. And it happens because there's confounding. And confounding happens for many reasons. But basically, when you collect lots and lots of data, you end up getting individuals that are related to each other, rather closely related to each other. You get people from different ethnicities. And these are just some of the sources um, uh, of confounding that can uh, uh, mess up these uh, uh, GWAS. Now, here, here's, an, here's a simple example. So let's just, just consider one SNP. So we're looking across the whole genome. We're just looking at one single nucleotide polymorphism. And uh, it's either uh, an A or a T, as shown here. Here is a set of people that have, let's say they have the disease. They're called cases. Here's a set of people that don't have the disease. They're called controls. And if you just stand back, you see, ah, there's more blue here and more orange here. So there's a difference. But it, what if it turns out that um, there's two populations, maybe two different ethnicities. Here's population one, as I've shown here. And here's population two, uh, shown down here. And in population one, there's more blues than oranges. And in pop population two, there's more orange uh, than blue. Uh, and if it now just so happens that there's more population one in the cases than the controls, suddenly you have this false result. It looks like there's a difference between the cases and, the, and controls. But there really isn't. It's just due to this, um, this confounding of multiple populations. OK, so this problem just gets worse and worse as your data gets, data gets larger and larger, which is what you want to do to find these weak signals. So one solution is throw out the data, start tossing people that are closely related. Uh, but th this is actually a very bad idea statistically. Uh, think about it. If you have two people that are very similar uh, and their phenotypes or their traits are different, and if, the, uh, if, if there's a genetic cause of that um, trait, then you only have to look at the differences between those two people. And you know that the, whatever is causing those uh, different traits are in that difference. So if you have people that are very closely related, you can actually get more power out of uh, your analysis. So it's a really bad idea, statistically, to throw away uh, related people. Now, fortunately, um, the, uh, the plant and animal breeders figured this out a long time ago. Um, they've been in this genomics business for a, a lot, lot longer than the human genomicists have. And they very early on, decades ago, realized uh, that they could solve this problem with a very fancy statistical technique known as a linear mixed model. I'm not going to go into the details, but suffice it to say, you take this mixed model, you apply it to the data, and it gets rid of that problem I just showed you and a whole lot of other problems that have to do with confounding. But there's a catch. When you run a linear mixed model uh, on a data set representing n individuals, you're going to take an n cubed computational hit and an n squared memory hit. And that's going to be OK for sample sizes, you know, 5,000, 10,000. But you get much beyond that, and you're stuck. You can't do it. Uh, so what we did, basically with a set of uh, algebraic tricks, is we figured out how to make this linear mixed model algorithm linear both in runtime and memory. And as a uh, sort of a freak bonus, it turns out that what we did to make this algorithm faster also made it better. It made it able to see weaker signals. Uh, and so we, we published this in uh, uh, Nature Methods uh, about a year back. So let me, uh, for the machine learning people in the audience, this, this is a slide for you. Uh, uh, I mean, it's a very, very, very rare situation where you make something faster and you make it better. How in the world is that possible? Well, here's the quick machine learning story. So what a linear mixed model does to capture this confounding is it basically computes similarities between every pair of individuals uh, in your data set. Uh, and then it uses those similarities to correct for the confounding. Uh, so if you take this view, naively you would think, well, if I have a million SNPs or 10 million SNPs, I should use them all to compute the similarity between two individuals, because the more SNPs I have, the better estimate of similarity I'm going to get, right? Well, it turns out that using a limb uh, to look for these associations is actually equivalent to performing linear regression with these SNPs that you've chosen to, to uh, uh, compute similarity, with those SNPs used as covariates. 
So now, as a machine learning person, if I were to hand you a million potential covariants, you would laugh at me, or you certainly wouldn't use them. You'd say, I'm just going to throw a bunch of noise into my analysis. And what you're going to do is feature selection, or something like feature selection, to get rid of most of those covariates before you use them. Well, we just did the same thing. When you do this in the space of GWAS, instead of using millions of markers, uh, for most GWAS, you're ending up using hundreds of SNPs uh, to compute these similarities between individuals or alternatively to use them as covariates. And when you have this very small number, that's where you get one of the ON savings. You go from uh, uh, ON, uh, ON squared to ON, actually. There's another trick, another algebraic trick that we introduced to go from ON cubed to ON squared. But that, that's the story in a nutshell. So now we have this algorithm that's very fast. And we said, let's do something that you, know, you just could do before. So uh, we said, well, instead of just looking at uh, correlations between a single SNP and a trait one at a time, which is what everybody does, we said, let's look at all p uh, uh, correlations between all pairs of SNPs and, and a, a particular trait. And there can be interesting, it's generally well believed that there's going to be uh, interesting interactions between pairs of SNPs, but no one, it, ju it just couldn't be done before. Uh, at least for uh, large data sets. And so um, we said, Let, let's give it a try. So we took a standard data set, the Welcome Trust data set. Um, in that data set, there's about seven, um, there's um, uh, traits f uh, corresponding to seven common diseases shown here. And we analyzed all of them. Uh, there's about 350,000 SNPs. And so if you do the math, that's about 60 billion pairs. So we set out the task of checking associations between all 60 billion pairs of these SNPs and these seven traits. Now, uh, if you were to do that on a single machine, even with FastLim, all the speed ups of FastLim, it would take 1,000 computer years to do that work. If you didn't have FastLim, I mean, forget about it. It's uh, absolutely infeasible. But uh, because we had FastLim and because we had Azure, where we could fire up many, many thousands of nodes at once to do this computation in parallel, we got the job done in uh, 13 days. And sure enough, uh, we found some new interesting results. Uh, the most exciting ones, I think, are in coronary artery disease. Uh, we found two genes that interact with each other a whole lot. And each of those genes separately interact with lots of other genes as well. So this is now being uh, followed up uh, by the experts. So with that, uh, I just want to say if you're interested, if, if for the, the, the genomicists in the audience, uh, if you want to give it a crack, it's uh, freely available just uh, being FastLim. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and finally we have our token non-David. Um, <laughs> Uh, George was a professor at UCSD, and now he's working for Microsoft Research in the networking group, um, which is actually one of the great things about Microsoft Research. I'm in the distributed systems group and spending a bunch of time doing biology, so there's a great deal of flexibility between where you report and what you do. Um, and he's going he's gonna to tell us about some work that he's done um, about how to, how to do fast querying of genomic data. Well, thank you, Bill. And uh, today I'd like to talk to you about uh, interactive genomics, which is a joint project between UCSD and MSR, and some of the people like Vineet and Ravi are here. So, so the stage has been set, and I'm sure you'll believe that all these things are, all these good things are happening. Ah, sorry, I should be put it in, sorry. Good job. All right, so the stage has been set, and I'm sure you'll believe that hardware costs are falling. There's lots more genomic data being produced. There is electronic medical records that are, in, uh, uh, that are coming soon, and cancer genomics is very interesting. But I ho and I hope you will also believe that software is a bottleneck. From some of Dave's numbers, Software today, genomic software, is very batch-oriented. It takes days for analysis. It is hard to write. Even the best frameworks take you, take you a long time, and they're script-oriented. And sharing is rare. So the natural question for a computer scientist is, software is bad. What abstractions can we use to help genomic software? So here's what we propose. 
We start by proposing a browsing abstraction to query these large genomic data sets that the two Daves are trying to assemble so that we can quickly sift through genomic data and remove fruitless hypotheses before we test them in the wet lab. In order to do that, we need to propose some other abstractions. And the first one, it's a very simple one, is that prob a lot of genomic processing is probabilistic and we'd like to separate them into two what software people would call layers with a well-defined interface. And the interface is characterized by three specific operators that we believe abstract what we would call noise-tolerant interval computation. We also propose that you need fundamentally different optimizations for this database that's here. And in particular, we'll, I'll try to describe an optimization idea called lazy joins that seems kind of useful. I'll also briefly refer to a prototype we built where we ran some of these queries and the longest query on the Azure cloud and it took about 60 seconds and it was about 20 times more concise and eight times faster than GATK, which is a pretty competitive framework. All right, let me start with this vision of interactive genomics. So imagine, if you will, there is this large database of genomes that the two Davids are putting together, but you've annotated them as well with electronic medical records where each genome has a list of disease codes like L for leukemia and H for heart disease. And in addition, there is a guy called Bob who's a drug designer, and he has a hunch that deletions in some gene cause hypertension and therefore he can sort of build a drug for this. But he doesn't know which gene. So he goes ahead and types in a query which says, please tell me all deletions in hypertension patients. The database selects out the, g the genomes that correspond to hypertension. It then goes ahead and looks at the red regions which are these deletions and then returns what is common to all of them. And let's say this takes a few seconds. So Bob can keep on trying various hunches, validating them with the existing data, just as we do today with regular data, and before he goes to the wet lab. And this seems to be compelling. And so uh, we, this is a discovery paradigm, but you could also extend this to medicine if you have, in addition to diseases, you also have treatments, like the drugs you use. So a doctor could use this to try to figure out which treatments have worked. So, why not just have a simple relational database in the sky? Why have all this complexity? Everybody has referred to this, but let me just repeat this basic bit of background. Think of DNA as two large linear strings, right, which are three million bases long. A base is four characters, A, C, G, and T, but it can't be read like a tape from left to right. The current technology can only grab little snippets or fragments of about 100 characters and then go ahead and read them and then align them to a reference. The data is quite big. The single DNA uh, from one person is about 100 gigabytes because each base is amplified with a quality score. The thing I'd like you to remember is in terms of software, what's going on is there are three levels of software. First, we take those reads, and in order to get some vantage point, we align them to this reference, the human genome. And then we leverage the observation David referred to that we're all 99% similar, and we say, well, we really don't want to store all this. It's hard to work with all this data. Let's just get a high-level diff in a computer science terms, and they do it in terms of what are called variants. Once we've done those, we can get to the interesting work, which is actually correlating variants with diseases like David does and David Heckerman. And so think of these three steps as in your model. And the thing that, is, that really complicates matters is that everything is probabilistic, right? Because there are all kinds of problems because the fragments are randomly sampled, we can make mistakes in reading the, inst the instrument could make mistakes, we could align it in the wrong place, so all our conclusions are tentative and have to be labeled with probabilities. Okay, so that's a lot of text, so I'll just give you a picture quickly to make sure this model is firmly in your head. Those are the two strings on top, the blue strings, one from your father and one from your mother. The little yellow substrings are little random samples that are picked with uniform probability from one of those two strings, and there's lots of them so that they kind of cover this entire thing, and then you align them at the bottom, uh, which is simple string searching with a few errors with a reference. All right, well, let's give you a quick model now of variant calling. And, and it's an important fact is that we don't assemble these things together, which would make things a lot easier. It's technologically hard and very expensive. 
All right, so now the next step in the software would be to actually go ahead and call some variants, so to get a high-level diff. And an example of a high-level diff is a deletion. And, and so that red portion has been deleted in the reference compared to the subject. And the way people tell this is a very nice piece of technology, which the Illumina uses, where they pair up two reads, two short reads, and they should be close to each other because they're actually sampled close by to each other. But if you map them back, to the reference, because of that red portion has been deleted, they're going to spread apart. And so these so-called discrepant or white apart, the read pairs that map white apart are a telltale sign of deletions. All right, that's just a little tutorial. Well, what are we doing? Now let's be computer scientists. And we abstract. We are abstraction merchants. So now forget those reads, and let's just see them as a bunch of small little green intervals in this vast line. And these, notice that these green intervals are paired because some of them come in pairs. And most of them should, the pairs should be close by, but in the middle we see a bunch of pairs that are far away. So we might want to figure out the regions where we have a sufficient number of wide apart pairs. And that's that blue region. We ignore the region on the right because it's just one of them and it conflicts with some other stuff. Now, we might want to get back the original reads that contributed, the original green intervals, forget reads, that contributed to this blue guy. And now we want to get some metadata about them. Like for example, these numbers like nine and one indicate our confidence that we got that read mapped or aligned in the right place. So in this case, we're not too happy. There are two, of, there's, there's only two of them. One of them is very confident, the other one is not. So the evidence, some of the witnesses are not so reliable. And so we assign a probability score to them, let's say point 0.1, because not so sure. So there is a natural abstraction boundary between the probabilistic part and the interval munging, and we're going to try to exploit that. Okay? So if you look at the layering picture, a very familiar picture to any of you who work in systems, we tend to have, let's say, the Ethernet, then we have IP and TCP, and we have the applications in a similar way. We have here an instrument layer, which is hardware, with like Illumina that produces these reads. These reads are mapped or aligned to a reference. And then those, that, that file, which is called BAM, is then passed to a variant caller. And finally, the variant file, or VCF file, is read by some applications like GWAS, like David Heckerman's, or many other kinds of stuff, like cancer genomics. So what we, the first and simplest proposal is let's just split these two apart. Let's separate the variant caller into an inference part, which can concentrate on the probabilities, and an evidence part that is concentrating on the, on, on the actual deterministic uh, uh, gathering of reads. So, and the, and more than just have a file format, we want an API. We want an interface. And that interface would be select the evidence you need by specifying, by, by, a, by querying. Now, in order to do that, you need to be more precise. You need to actually specify what you mean by query. And so in order to do that, we specified a query language in which intervals are first class. Now that's not surprising because lots of things in biology are, are intervals. The inputs, reads, are, 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 are intervals. The outputs, like the variant files, are, 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 are intervals. And even intermediate concepts like genes are intervals. So it's kind of natural to think in terms of intervals. So the data model, we started with toying with an interval calculus. And we decided, let's just make it SQL-like because it's more likely that it's going to be used. And so think of SQL tables, except that tables now have two columns for a start of interval and an end of interval, and we have three operators. The first one is just vanilla SQL, select. Select a bunch of rows that have a property. The second one is mildly more interesting. We can join two tables, and we join them not just by equality of key, which is equijoin, but where the intervals intersect, we join them. So we want to join a bunch of reads, for example, with a bunch of genes. The third operator is probably most unusual because the first, the second one is actually in geographical databases and spatial databases. So the third, is, third operator is a way to merge intervals. And basically, we try to make a kind of noise tolerant union. Think of each interval as voting for some activity. And it's only when k of them vote for it that we actually believe that something is actually happening. So in this picture, we have a bunch of green intervals. And if we say we want three pieces of evidence, and we say, ah, only that blue portion has three reads, three, three, three such intervals overlapping, and those two blue intervals, and that's the operator we're going to use. 
So let's go back to our abstract picture of deletion. And so we start with the reads. And now, naturally, what we want to do is select out from those that table of reads the, the subset of reads where the pairs are pretty wide apart. Not only that, we probably want to merge them with k equal to 2 so that we get rid of these cruddy little reads and get these large intervals, logical intervals. But now we may want to go back to the original data so that we can actually compute interesting scores for inference. And so now we join back with the original data. Okay? And so you can think of this inference layer as making all these calls across this abstraction boundary, which allows us to make progress. So <laughs> what's the point of doing this? Inference is pretty much in flux. There are different methods and different people. By having a very deterministic uh, set of operators, it's something we know as computer scientists how to do. It allows an industry to go out and build this while people are figuring out which kind of inference and, and allow them to use different kinds of inference. Just to sort of make the point again, we actually embodied all these concepts in a language that we built at UCSD. And, uh, and so you go ahead and the same query is now in programmatic terms. You do a select, you go ahead and merge them, and finally you join them back, and then you output the results. So the equivalent in GATK, which a number of people mentioned, would take about 150 lines of Java code. And this is uh, uh, certainly more concise. All right, so we ran this. So what happened? Well. We ran this on something called NA18506, which happens to be a genome in the 1000 Genomes Project. Uh, why, uh, it's, uh, it's a genome from Africa. So GQL, this is the, the name for the language we use, as opposed to the concept, genome query language. It found 113 deleted intervals and just grows on one. Now, the irony, though, is that there was an earlier study by Conrad et al. that found just eight in the same individual. And so there was this natural question, how do these results compare? And I think David uh, Hausler will tell you, at least, that such conflicts in biology are common. Results are often conflicting. But what do you do? Do you just leave it that way? Well, that's the whole point of GQL. It allows us to probe further. So we said, all right, let's just join. Let's not do any scripting, write any code. We'll just do a join, find out the set, the set of deletions in Conrad that's not in ours. And now let's just look at Conrad's deletions a little more closely with a microscope. Well, let's select from them reads which have high pair separations, and we found none. And that's the telltale sign. But there's the other piece of evidence you might want to do. Well, if there is a deletion, very few reads should have mapped to that region, and they should have been reduced coverage in that region, and we didn't find any evidence there. Further, it happens that the one we used happens to have, we happen to have the parents' genomes too. So the deletions we found that Conrad didn't, we decided to try them and see whether they were in the parent, and it looked very likely they were in the parent. Now remember, we didn't assign any probabilities, so this is all pretty loose. But nevertheless, it gives you a sense that you could use this kind of stuff to allow interactive sifting of results. And we have a bioinformatics paper which has a lot more details about how we go about this and the results, and maybe some results for cancers too, which, uh, we, we've, and again, we haven't done wet lab confirmations, but it suggests the, the potential power of this. Now, don't get focused on deletions, right? This applies to many other things like SNPs, copy numbers, inversions, and phasing. And um, inversions are simply finding reverse substrings, copy numbers, as the David's reference to is finding replicated substrings. And phasing is ascribing substrings to either your mom's copy or your dad's copy. All of them are useful. And uh, we use deletion as an example. Our abstractions apply to these as well. We have a CACM paper which describes uh, the, the mappings. All right, so we try to build this. And our first version, you know, it seems so simple, right? It's just a browser. What's the <laughs> it was awfully slow. And we had to learn the hard way how to optimize this. And we had to do it from scratch. We didn't use a database. We did everything from scratch. And so the first thing we did was to notice that many whole genome queries, walking across these 3 billion lines, right, most of the time, you only need the metadata. You really, you just want to find the reads that are far apart. You just need the mate IDs, so to speak. You don't need the entire text of the genome, of, of, of the read. So why not store a separate file with just that port? In database world, it's very common. It's known as a materialized view, right? So all we do is use the small view for scanning. So we have very little disk bandwidth. And then when we are ready to dive in, we go into the actual text files, right? It's an obvious idea. Right. But it's the kind of stuff computers, there's so much fruit waiting over here for us. To me, the more interesting optimization was something called lazy joins. 
So all of you probably know what a join in database is. What you do is you look for a row in one, uh, in one table and a row in another table that match. In this case, the t intervals intersect. And then you stick them together. You join them. Now, normally what you do is you actually join them and you make a new table. But here's the problem. Some of our columns are way humongous big, right? And if we allow users to make joins after joins after joins, we're going to write a huge amount of stuff to disk. And in the end, we might actually select out a small portion. So why are we doing this? So instead, we use trees and stuff like that to find the indexes. Say row 12 joins to row 15, row 6 to row 18, 1, and we just store a logical structure. And because this is recursive, so we have to build a tree. It's not easy, right? And in the end, we have to walk the tree, but it's still worthwhile because these columns are so wide, right? And it's a good thing to do. And so we build this stuff, and we use the obvious parallelism, each chromosome in a separate Azure virtual memory. And we use 24 virtual memories, which cost 96 cents an R. And this deletion query, which is quite hard, and the, we ran a number of them. The hardest one took 60 seconds, but on a single genome. <laughs> so we have a long ways to go to get to the million, but, but I think there are ways out. And if you, if you believe in databases, if you believe in indices, I think there are ways to do this. So I think interactivity is plausible. All right, so let me summarize. So, so the vision is simply that we would like to give biologists and geneticists the idea, the ability to do hypothesis generation in seconds, not in hours or days, what we'd call interactive genetics. So the spec three ideas I'd call out are this evidence inference separation. By the way, it's not an obvious idea. It's a very controversial idea. There's lots of probabilistic information at the reads that we are ignoring, right? So people will say, why are you doing this? How can you do this? You know, and, but if you look at the history of networking, we had very poor links. And if we started leaking stuff about links to file transfer, we would never have built the internet. The forget about Facebook. So we learned that sometimes you have to give up information. And when you do that, you hope that eventually the links get better, the instruments get better. And so that's the proposal. We're not sure it's going to fly, but certainly we're going to make it. Okay, the database mixes existing ideas, and then there's the idea of interval operators, thinking of intervals as first class and lazy joints. The database mixes existing ideas, but I think it's crucial to get the whole package right. I really don't think it's going to work if you take SQL Server and start trying to do this. You have to, I think, do this from scratch. The applications are exciting. There's cancer genomics, there's newborn genomics, there's personalized medicine, and there's a whole raft load. All right, so I'd like to especially call out the person who did all this work, who's not here, sadly, right? His Christos Kozanitis, who uh, is going to be a postdoc at Berkeley with Dave Patterson and Ian Stoika and the rest of the gang. So he's a great guy. He's built this. And uh, certainly, if you, if you want details. Also, there are two people in this room, Vineet Bafna, who I learned all my biology. Vineet, can you put up your hand? If you have any questions, you ask Vineet. <laughs> and, uh, and finally, Ravi, who helped us with all the experiments. Where is Ravi? Ravi somewhere. Everybody knows Ravi. And so, and, and for more details, we have a systems paper which has a lot more details and numbers and charts and all the good stuff that uh, I've ignored. So, thank you very much. Um, sure. Yeah, we, we've only got a minute or two. Yeah. We have maybe one minute. So, so you guys come up. You can take breaths. <laughs> Questions for any any of the speakers?
framework that only by caring will we get the answer. And it's very compelling in the diseases that you heard Dave Peckerman talk about. Uh, you don't get uh, good, good results for the GWAS until you're up in the 100, uh, 10,000, 100,000. And so for most of those, that community has already had to get people who picking and screaming did not want to share their data, but weren't getting any results of statistical significance. They actually were brought to the table picking and screaming and, and, and combined their data in order to get those results. So it can happen. Sense is, my sense is you, you really are looking for the, the, the broad ecosystem to start computing right. in a way that it doesn't today. That's yeah. right. Uh, just, just Dave's nice mm -hmm. list of major challenges, problems. Yeah. I, at least in my view, uh, an additional major challenge problem is to figure out as computer scientists, how do we get that ecosystem to compute? And that involves right. that's the issue of alliances. Of, the alliance is, is a, like a moonshot, right? It, the, the, the global alliance that was in the newspapers, it, it's like a moonshot, right? It's a, trying to organize people all around the world to agree to collaborate and share data. And so now we've got the, and the treaty's been signed. Yeah, right. <laughs> so now we'll see, you know, what's going to follow, right? There is money that's been set aside by some organizations. There's people that are being identified. There's communities being formed. But, you know, it's like the early days of the uh, internet, I guess. And, you know, uh, how's this going to turn out? Uh, before this, he would just say depressingly, it's not going to happen, right? Look at the history. Now there's uh, some hope, you know, and maybe good people, you know, well-meaning people will be cooperating. Well, we're now officially over time, so I'd like to thank the speakers again and all the and the audience for coming.